it is time to continue the series. And I'm so excited to be here. I can't even tell you. I'm still nervous, but I'm so excited. I love this series so much. I love Pierce Brown's writing. I love these characters. I'm terrified. And I know that I'm going to get my heart torn out. But I'm here for it. Let's go. I'm finally ready to read Iron Gold. Okay, I am through the first three Darrow chapters and the first two Lyria chapters. And first of all, it was so good to see Darrow and Severo and Victra and Mustang all show up on the pages again. I actually feel like the tone of Darrow's narrative hasn't... It didn't feel foreign to me. I don't feel like... It's changed between Morningstar and Iron Gold in the sense that it's very much still him. He feels obviously older, carrying the weight of a aftermath now, but I like that it still very much feels like we're just moving into a time jump, but it's still Darrow. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and this might seem like a small thing, but I'm also very glad that... Um, Pierce decided to start the book with Darrow because I think, especially like three full chapters of him, because I think it really grounds the reader after an entire trilogy only from Darrow's perspective. And I do think that Lyria was actually an interesting and good choice after him. Obviously, I don't know anything about her character yet, hardly, but I like that he's showing the contrast of the life of the Reds before and now with Lyria's POV of the aftermath and what the Reds are dealing with, especially since he's he's jumping into the Gammas, who were not enemies per se of Darrow at the very beginning of Red Rising, but they were definitely, you know, kind of like they're being attacked for now, the favorites, so to speak. And so humanizing them and showing the reality of how they're being treated and the squalor of their conditions. Um, I'm already loving this because one of the things that I think that this is going to do is that oftentimes in big revolutionary stories like this, it's it's very it's big and it's glorious and we're you know putting the world back the way that it's supposed to go because everyone has these grand ideals of of how to make things better and then you get to the aftermath when things are supposed to be better and you realize the complexity of running a society across this large of a space of an entire you know galaxy and how the reality of that is manifesting now for all of the different levels of this society. So I love that because I love that we got the young idealism and the revolutionary intensity that existed in the original trilogy. And I like that we're already kind of dismantling the romanticization of that in this book so I'm here for it. I'm I'm loving the writing style. Again, it feels it feels very familiar and I think that was one of my biggest fears honestly was that I was going to start Iron Gold and it was going to feel like a completely different book with completely different characters and it doesn't. It just feels like a continuation of the story and the characters that I loved in the original trilogy so far. I'm only 5 chapters in, but I'm really liking it so far. Guys, we have a problem. I cannot stop reading this book. <laughs> So I'm like 100 pages in already and I am binging this the same way I binged the original series and I'm obsessed. And I love Cassius and Lysander together so far. I love them. The idea of Cassius turning into a like deep space rebel in hiding is wonderful and I love that. And I'm I love the connection between him and Lysander and how he's kind of trying to 
reconnect with the past or right old wrongs through Lysander when it comes to, you know, his brother Julian, etc. And I love it. I love it so much. Ephraim um, is a really rough, interesting POV so far, and I'm not really sure how he fits into everything yet. The other ones, I was like, oh yeah, this makes sense. Ephraim, like, I get, I know who he is, but I'm not really, like, it'll be interesting to see how he converges with everything else. But so far, no complaints, and I cannot stop reading this book, so it's, things are looking promising. Okay, you guys, well, I have officially binged 150 pages of this book today. I like Lyria's POV. Really like Lysander's POV only because I'm getting a lot of Cassius, which makes me incredibly happy. So I'll take it. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing a little bit more of Ephraim's character and kind of he's less familiar, I guess, because Lyria, we get this very like down in the mud red point of view, which is kind of a little bit of how we got Darrow in the first books. And Lysander and Cassius are obviously familiar. So Ephraim is really the only one so far that isn't like connecting as quickly for me. And I think that literally just comes down to a familiarity at this point. Kavax is wonderful as always. I adore the Telemannus family so much. I love them so much. And I love the way that he is interacting with Lyria. If Pierce Brown does anything else to Liam during the course of this series, I'm going to be very angry because Liam should be protected at all costs. I like, I like the version of this that Pierce Brown is going with where he's you know, the, the Senate is turning on Darrow and because trying to establish a new society and government and everything, what a mess, what an absolute mess. And the short-sightedness of a lot of these ruling groups in terms of like, they're so willing to just be like, well, we want peace. So yeah, let's trust the Ash Lord. Sure, why not? And, you know, maybe maybe Pierce Brown is wanting me to throw my lot in with Darrow and believe Darrow, and maybe Darrow's just being an unreliable narrator and the Ash Lord does actually want peace, but somehow I doubt it. Okay, so it is beautiful outside, so I came out here to do my update because... It's gorgeous and I'm soaking it in before the weather becomes infernally hot this summer. I'm about 200, a little over 200 pages in to Iron Gold now and I am more intrigued by the Ephraim chapters now because, excuse me, I'm really liking that we're getting a little bit of the underworld here because that is again one of the things with Darrow's perspective in the first trilogy is just that it's so at the very top the whole time you know like he he dabbles in little bits and pieces of people who work underground and in the in the sin like that kind of dark underbelly of the story but we never get to be in it so the fact that Ephraim's chapters are allowing us to delve into further layers of the society and see more parts of it that we haven't before I'm really liking that I love Darrow and Severo so much, and I still love Severo. He's, he definitely feels a little bit more subdued in this book than he did in the original trilogy, but I think part of that I'm okay with just because he's older, right? He's he's still very much Severo, but he's, he's very slightly tempered at this point, and I don't know if that's going to continue, but there's a part of me that's kind of surprised that Mustang agreed to... Um, imprisoned Darrow. There's a part of me that's surprised by that. I feel like her character is the one that feels the most changed in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm sure, again, part of that is because of what she's been through and the fact that she's older and that she's had to become a sovereign. And that's, you know, that'll change you. But I feel like her character, her character feels very different than it did in the first three books. And I'm not loving that 
but I'm, I'm trusting it so far. So anyways, that is my current update. All right, so it's time for a front porch discussion. Um, I'm sitting on sort of my front porch. As you can see, we are in the middle of renovating it because it was starting to be a bit of an eyesore. There's the train right on time. So I'm about 250 pages in and it's so, it's, it's starting to feel a bit jarring just because there's so much happening right now. And because it's in multiple POVs, it is taking my brain a little bit to catch up with the shift from just Darrow's perspective. Now that we're getting more going on, which is fine. I'm not mad at it. Um, Lysander and Cassius, I'm really liking so far. I know a lot of people are kind of iffy on Lysander's perspective, and I'm sure there's a reason for that that I haven't run across yet, but I'm really liking them so far. I'm hoping that we get like an explosion of just Cassius saying screw it all and, you know, going ham on somebody at some point. I'm sure that's coming. When we left off in Morningstar, you know, Darrow and Mustang had their baby. They're, they're at the end of the initial wave of the uprising and creating a new society. But we never got anything in between there at all. There was not like the little quick moment that we get of them before Darrow uh, goes AWOL was already, like, you could already see it coming. And that, I don't know, it, it, I feel like there was a detachment there that shouldn't, like an emotional detachment there that shouldn't have been there. Or that we needed more time, we needed something else. Because I just, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not feeling that part. Um, also, can we just talk about briefly Deep Grave Prison? Because I have a massive phobia of the sea and the depths of it. And that is legitimately one of the most terrifying places I've ever read an intro for in fantasy. There's a couple things. I'm, there's so many things. There's so many things happening, you guys. Ephraim is really interesting. I'm, again, still loving the, the syndicate kind of aspect of this and seeing Darrow from a different perspective. We're seeing Darrow f in a very different light through these characters that have had to deal with the after effects of being on the lower tiers of the uprising and the cost of that, which I love. And I really commend Pierce for following through on that in this series because I think a lot of fantasy stories deal with the uprising and the like, you know, it's it's a big glorious ascension to a new era and then that's the end. And I appreciate that Pierce is, is showing the cycle of this and how each society rises and falls and breaks down and falls apart and has growing pains. And like, there's so many aspects to this that I feel like he's trying to dig into. And I appreciate that. The last thing I wanna say is I paused in the middle of a chapter to come and do this video because Darrow and Severo and the Howlers are just about to free someone from Deep Grave Prison. And I am just having a little moment where I'm like, who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Oh my gosh, who is it? Anyways, that's where we're at. Um, it's so weird. It's so weird to be reading more of this story still. Um, I've read the original trilogy like four times. The first book I'm, I've read at least five or six times. Um, so it is really weird to like read more of a story that is very well established in my head. Okay, so I just got back from a concert today, so I'm really tired and all I have the energy to do is sit on my bed and read Iron Gold. And I'm just into page about 300 and I'm reading an Ephraim chapter and just a basic observation that I have is that I love how sulky obsidians are because I feel like Ragnar was really sulky in some a few times and then Sefi is kind of sulky and broody and I just love that about them I love that obsidians are sulky and broody that makes me incredibly happy and now to see Volga also 
especially being that way. Okay, so I really like the reveal with Ephraim being Philippe. I kind of suspected that that was a possibility. Um, not necessarily that it was Ephraim, but like something connected with that. I'm really liking the subplots that are going through this. I like the convergences. I'm really curious to see how and if, I'm assuming, they all converge, but I just don't know if it's going to be in this book. We'll see. But I'm starting to get that feeling in the pit of my stomach that knows we're halfway through now and Pierce is making me, like, endearing me to these characters. And I know that he doesn't usually wait till the end of a series to start cutting heartstrings. So I'm moving forward with some trepidation. Okay, so I'm back to reading tonight. But like, what is this? I don't like that the, all of a sudden, we're going from having names at the beginning of chapters to 60% of the way through the book, suddenly we have chapter titles and it's not telling us who the POV is. That's not my favorite. I'm not loving that. Apollonius Wrath is a really fascinating antagonist to throw in with Darrow and I absolutely love that we're getting kind of a grown-up version of Tactus because obviously in Red Rising the first three books Tactus is a major like point of interest character for Darrow's group and because he specifically has such a different worldview and moral code than Darrow and a lot of the other close-knit friend group and I love that Apollonius now is being thrown in as a similar wrench here and it, it just feels like there's so many callbacks to the original trilogy and it's all leveled up in this new one. Also um, Lyria as a character I really like how again she is a callback to Darrow from the first trilogy where she's a young Red who's brought up to the world she doesn't know and she's trying to figure her stuff out and she's made essentially the ward of a, of a major gold house. However, I find her narrative harder to like, she, not like, than I did Darrow. I don't know. And obviously circumstances for her are completely different. Um, but I really like that she's being thrown into Pax's uh, path. And the gas bomb just blew up in the ship with them. And Pax being kidnapped and being the package that Ephraim is going after doesn't really surprise me. At least I'm assuming it's Pax at this point because... I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's not Sophocles that they're after. Maybe. I don't think so. But I'm kind of scared to keep reading. I don't know, I don't know what, where this is going. So, anyways. I think Lysander and Cassius are still my favorite POV at this point. And also, Dido is fantastic. I'm loving her character. She's an interesting parallel to Octavia from the original trilogy. And I like her character. She's very interesting. And the tension of them finding out who Cassius is. I'm going to predict that Cassius sweeps the floor with Dido's nephew Bellerophon because it's Cassius and he better the frick not die this early into the second series or I'm going to quit and I'm just gonna say that right now because I love Cassius and I'm so ready to watch him be like vigilante knight Cassius I'm so here for it I like that Lysander is kind of awkwardly in the middle and he's still trying to figure out himself and where he stands and and what he wants to do going forward I like his struggle internally um but anyways, that's my thoughts for now. Hopefully Cassius is fine. Okay, things just got really real and I knew Pax was going to be kidnapped. I'm not okay right now, you guys. <laughs> like, Also, that whole scene 
I thought Sophocles was maybe gonna die and that freaked me the heck out. And then Kavax, no thank you. Oh my gosh, I was just waiting for one of them to die. And I was like, if Pierce Brown kills Kavax like this, I will throw a fit. I will throw a fit. So, deep breathing. This is going to be a problem because all of the, it's throwing a wrench in the conflict between everyone else and I'm here for that, but oh my gosh, like these poor kids. And also I cannot wait to see Electra because she's a little, she is Severo's daughter for a reason y'all. Like she's not going to take this sitting down. That is by far the most tense scene in this book so far. So that's just all I wanted to say and now I need to keep reading. Okay guys, I'm at my parents' house for a family gathering and I cannot stop reading this book. I don't want Cassius to die. I know that Cassius wants Cassius to die, but I do not want that and so he's not allowed. That's all I have to say about that because I need a reunion between Darrow and Cassius in any form. I don't care. I just want it to happen. The crime syndicate is intense and Ephraim is in some deep crap. That's all I have to say about that. And I'm so angry at Pax and Electra being put in this situation and I hate. Revenge is such an ugly, ugly, ugly thing and I think that this book continues that theme. The overthrow of this incredibly oppressive class system morally makes sense because of what it was doing to all of the people in it. That being said, when the pendulum swings the complete opposite way, that's still just as ugly. The, the uh, Duke of Hands treating Pax, who has had nothing to do with anything, who is an innocent child at this point, asking him to pay for the sins of adults who he, most of whom he hasn't even met or like, you know, he, like, <laughs> it's such an ugly thing. Revenge is such an ugly thing. That's my update for you guys right now. I'm just, I know that I'm, I'm kind of spaced out about it, but that's, the feelings are feeling. Okay, so that's where we're at. Okay, guys, so I am very, getting very close now. I think I'm on page like 480. So things are definitely still getting tenser at the end. I love this darker, colder, older version of the main crew from the original trilogy. Um, Mustang, Darrow, Severo, Victra even. Victra still feels very similar, but like Mustang's threat with when she's talking to um, Ephraim and Lyria. It's hard because I see the struggle in her to be the sovereign and also to be Darrow's wife and the wife of the Reaper. Her character, like she's had a couple of moments in this book, but overall I think she's been my big biggest disappointment in this book, which is really making me sad because I love Mustang. I'm really glad that Pierce did not drag out this thing with Ephraim. I'm really glad that he's already going from working with a group he didn't want to work with to working with another group that now he doesn't want to work with. And I'm interested to see how that develops his character going forward. I'm going to keep going. I'm really curious to see how Ephraim converging with uh, the sovereign and that whole group is gonna go and i don't want to be around when darrow and severo find out that all of this happened because it's gonna get wild real quick okay well i'm 95 percent sure that a couple of our howler characters are gone and i'm gonna have to wait until darrow's next pov to find out who which is slightly maddening also I don't believe for a hot second that Cassius is dead. I just don't. I didn't see a body. I just don't. I don't buy it.
So he's coming back at some point because there's no way that was his end. There's no way. Okay. So like Daryl being a little bit of a moron isn't new, but this whole thing where he's got this plan to, you know, storm the castle I'm assuming that there's going to be a twist at the end where, like, Darrow knows something I don't or something that Severo doesn't know. Because right now, it just feels like Darrow's just being really stupid for no reason. And I don't get it. I don't get it. Severo's 100% right. When he was like, hey, Darrow, this is really dumb. We should not do this. And Darrow's like, no, it's going to be fine. You're, trust me, blah, blah, blah. And I know he's kind of like Hail marrying it, where he's just, I'm going in, I'm finishing this war, I want to be done. I get that. I get the desperation of that. But, like, I didn't think we were still this stupid, you know? So, I don't know. We'll see how the ending pans out, I guess. I'm sorry, what? Lysander? Just turned on Gaia. To align himself with people he knows are going to kill him after they just killed Cassius. What? <laughs> I mean, I haven't finished this scene yet, but I'm just kind of mentally flailing a little bit here, trying to figure out why? Now that Cassius is gone, apparently Lysander's intellect has fled his body, and I'm feeling a little bit let down at the moment because Lysander was my favorite POV up to this point. And now I feel like at the end of the book, Darrow's making really dumb decisions, and Lysander's making really dumb decisions, and not that I, like, expect my characters to be perfect. But I'm having a hard time following. I'm at the very end of the book. I have about that much left. And at this point, Pax and Electra, like, I could just do with a book about them, to be honest. Because they've been more interesting in this last little bit, in the tiny little bit that they had than most of the main characters. I don't know how this is going to end. I've given up guessing how these characters are going to react to things because nothing makes sense. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Okay, are we all still in middle school here? Because now... Hello, Pippin. Hi. Victra's whole thing now with Lyria? What? I feel like I, all of these characters are just acting like children and making impulsive decisions that make no sense. I'm so confused. Like, I understand that, like, Victra and Darrow and even Severo, Severo hasn't done anything yet, but, like, that we're all just, they're, they're warriors, right? Yeah, I get that. But these are just dumb decisions <laughs> like so dumb and they're and not dumb in the sense that you're just like oh that was a that was a mistake it's like what I'm so lost you guys like what what <laughs> I don't even know at this point I don't even know I'm just gonna finish this book and I'm just here for the ride I guess okay guys Welcome to my final thoughts on Iron Gold. 
I finished it last night. So I'm really conflicted on how I feel about this. I am so happy, first of all, to be back with these characters because I love them and I will never say no to more Red Rising Saga content. I went into this with not really any expectations. If I'm being totally honest, I really didn't have like a this is what I want out of this part of the series. This is what I expect. I really didn't have much of that intentionally because I wanted this second part of the series to be its own thing and have its own space, especially because I would have had such high expectations coming off of the original trilogy that I think it was a good thing I waited so long to read the second half. What I think my biggest problem was throughout this book was that it felt like the characters coming in from the first trilogy, I kind of lost them a little bit in this book, other than Severo and Cassius. Severo and Cassius felt very much like 10 plus year older versions of themselves from the original trilogy, and I really, really loved both of them. And they felt recognizable. Darrow was okay through parts of the book, but in general, especially at the end, I feel like I really lost him as a character. And he started, he and, and some of the other characters started making decisions that didn't make sense based on who they are as characters to me. Victra was another one of those that very end decision of her to go after Lyria just felt so childish and petty and I'm like Victra is a warlord right she is she's impulsive she's a warrior she's gonna solve things through physical violence sometimes because that's the type of person she is I expect that of her I would have expected her to blow past whatever plan Mustang has to go after the syndicate but not to go after one girl whose fault it isn't that any of this happened. So it just, it felt super petty and childish. And I was like, what? <laughs> Darrow's decisions in this book just felt like, I felt like he was dumber than he was in the original trilogy, which was weird because I understand the idea of him wanting to just be done with this war. It's dragged out all this time. It has completely consumed his entire life, his family, his friends. He's exhausted. He's traumatized. He's suppressing his sense of self. I completely understand all of that, but it just felt like it's, it was, again, these kind of impulsive, childish decisions that I felt like he's even less of a good leader now than he was in the first trilogy. And I'm starting to wonder, why is everyone not following Severo? Because honestly, at this point, and honestly in a lot of the first trilogy too, Severo is just as good of, if not better, of a leader than Darrow. And I think that really started to come forward in this book. And I'm sure you could go into some kind of deep metaphorical thing about how, well, they're older and they've been, you know, tr destroyed by the war that they've been in. Yeah, I get all that. But also, it just didn't feel like... These characters didn't feel like themselves by the end. And it didn't feel like a natural breakdown of who they had been prior. It felt like something just almost like it was a little bit more plot driven than character driven, which is something that I always really struggle with. So honestly, Lysander is a character that did a complete 180 for me in this book. I really don't like him anymore now at the end. I really liked the trajectory of his plot line up until the end. And then when it switched, I was like, I don't know that I'm about that really. So I'm like, obviously there's more books, but I just, I'm not really that excited about where Lysander's POV is going anymore. And surprising me was the fact that Ephraim ended up being, I think, the most consistent and interesting POV throughout this entire book. Okay, well, my camera died. So here's the pickup to the rest of my thoughts on Iron Gold. I think that it's in a lot of ways it is a good setup. I'm I'm enjoying coming back to these characters. There's some good tension. It definitely feels like Pierce is kind of trying to 
get his footing a little bit off of the the original trilogy. Lyria as a character specifically, she had kind of a good solid set of kind of agency at the beginning, but then that sort of petered out as the book went on, and I did struggle a little bit with that just in terms of I felt like she was kind of just in the book so that she could blow up a shuttle. You know what I mean? Like that kind of felt like sort of her whole point. And I almost, I, I was talking with uh, my friend Laura from Fantasy Awash, go down and check out her channel in the, um, the links below. We were talking about how if we were to replace Lyria as a character, like were there any other characters that might have fit that kind of a feel better? And again, I like that Lyria brings in some of the, the not high up society kind of perspective because I think that's really important and Ephraim also does that. Electra was one of the characters that we brought up as a really interesting point of view character. I would have really liked to see something from Electra's point of view as Severo's daughter because I think giving Severo a POV at this point would feel a little bit weird. Um, but giving his daughter a POV, I feel like would have also potentially been an okay choice. I'm just kind of percolating at this point because it really doesn't matter, but yeah, overall, um, I had a really good time with this book overall. There were some decisions, especially in the last, like, 30% of the book, I feel like, that really kind of... I don't know. <laughs> I, I felt like I was, I was kind of knocked off my axis a little bit, and not in a good way. I feel like it was more, I don't understand why these characters are making these decisions. That doesn't make sense. The character that I felt like was written the most intriguingly is a toss-up between Ephraim and Apollonius, I think. Because Apollonius felt so well realized as a character. He's like absolutely off his rocker bonkers, but he was written in a way that it was immediate, like that immediate characterization and it was so poignant and it was such a good contrast to Darrow and the Howlers. Anyways, I've officially read Iron Gold, you guys. It is a miracle. It took us a long time to get here, but we're here now and I've read it and I am very excited to keep going uh, in the rest of the series and see what else uh, Pierce is doing with these characters because at this point I have no idea where this is going. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Definitely leave me a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content and check out the links below for a bunch of other places to find me. And yeah, I hope you guys are all reading some five-star reads. I hope that you're having a fantastic week and I'll see you in the next video.